I'm Tim. I'm Corinne. And here at Cinema Inspection, our life clock is flashing red, but before we go to Carousel, we're going to stop for a minute to talk about Logan's Run from 1976. Welcome to the 23rd century. The perfect world of total pleasure. Runner! There's just one catch. Michael York is Logan. Run, Logan! Policeman in a perfect world. No! Trained to track down runners. Run, Logan! Until he is forced to run himself. He's a runner! Logan! I'm your friend, I understand. We all go crazy once in a while. But she's a runner, and it's over. MGM takes you into a new age of adventure in the first motion picture of the 23rd century, Logan's Run. It begins where imagination ends. The year 2274 offers a paradise of every pleasure imaginable, except maturity. Before they reach the age of 30, every citizen of the walled city in which humanity survives must undergo carousel, a ritual they believe will renew them. Those that rebel against this rule, known as runners, are hunted down and killed by policemen known as Sandmen. Logan 5 is one of these Sandmen, assigned to investigate an underground that's been sneaking citizens out of the city to a rumored sanctuary. He convinces Jessica Six, a member of the underground, that he wants to run and infiltrates the group, but his loyalties become confused as he grows skeptical of Carousel and the system he served. He decides to escape into the outside world with Jessica, but his Sandman partner Francis Seven is pursuing them both. As usual, we'll be discussing Logan's run in detail, so if you haven't seen the movie and want to remain unspoiled, we recommend you watch the film before listening to the rest of the episode. Okay, well, why don't you tell us about your personal history with this movie? This is one of a series of sci-fi movies from the 70s that my mom would watch, and I just happened to be there watching it with her. <laughs> well, I loved it as a kid, and I mean, I love it now, but I haven't seen it for at least 10 years So its problems are striking me harder, and some of the subtext is much more pronounced. And this is one I came to pretty late. It was one of those movies I'd always heard about and loved the central idea of it. It's a really scary concept. But upon finally seeing it, I thought it's just a visually gorgeous movie, but some lapses in characterization and plot that we'll get into. On the other hand, a lot of the other elements make me want to give it a pass on those problems. Yeah, it's you have to give this movie a pass, and I don't know why, but it's the kind of movie you just, it's okay. You tried as hard as you could. <laughs> <laughs> and part of it, I think, is it turns out to be a very influential movie. You can yes. see a lot of other movies that have taken bits from it, and especially now with kind of the surge in dystopian young adult fiction and movies right now. There's a lot of individual elements from those that you can trace back to this story. Mm-hmm. All right, a little basic info about the production. It was released by United Artists on June 29th, 1976, uh, when it opened against the limited release of the outlaw Josie Wales. Uh, it was shot on a budget of $9 million and managed to gross $25 million during its theatrical run, and was based on the book by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Uh, the movie was nominated for two Oscars, for cinematography and set direction, but it won a special Oscar for visual effects, which, looking at those effects these days, seems a little surprising. It's not, not all of them hold up very well. Mostly because of Blu-ray technology, but I was still just enamored with those special effects until, of course, seeing it on the (laughs) Blu-ray. All right, let's talk about the cast and characters. Uh, First off, uh, top build is Michael York as Logan Five. Probably best known to modern audiences, and this is kind of depressing, as Basil Exposition from the Austin Powers movies. Uh, He also appeared as Tybalt in Franco Zeffirelli's version of Romeo and Juliet, uh, as D'Artagnan in the Musketeer films directed by Richard Lester, and I always remember him from the 1977 version of The Island of Dr. Moreau. He's great in that one. Actors previously considered for the role included Robert Redford and John Voight, and York would also work with the director of this movie, Michael Anderson, in Conduct Unbecoming, and uh, the movie Sword of Gideon. So what do we think of Michael York? I think he's amazing. And the little girl inside of me still has a crush on him from this era. But the character Logan really didn't have a lot of depth in either characterization or emotion. So I think it would have been a challenging role to really do a lot with. And he does the best he can with the material he's given. York always has this really 
particular way of speaking, that deep voice, it sounds very sort of aristocratic. And I, yes. I like that edge that he brings to the character. This is a guy who is happily shooting people during his work day and parties in the off hours and thinks everything is great. He'll invite women through the circuit and do drugs and ha, everything's wonderful. Yeah, free love, baby. And there's not much to the script to really indicate it, but you can see how things start to creep in. And even from the beginning, we see Logan is a little different from everybody else. Well, from the very first scene, we see he's different because he's visiting a nursery, which is where, when an Adam 11, for instance, it goes through Carousel, an Adam 12 is basically ordered and produced (laughs) so it's the the babies go to nurseries and logan is there and he's visiting one of the infants he's visiting logan six logan six Six. so we know of course logan's time is you know it's getting near because they've already got the logan six ready to go but I guess it, they say in this world it's very uncommon to go visit their nursery for any reason. And he says, you know, he's got this deep curiosity. So there is a bit of a difference between him and the typical city dweller. Yeah, most of the people in the city seem they lack any sense of responsibility or family connections or romantic connections or anything like that. It's all very surface level. And Oh, this, there is no family connection. The children are raised by machines. But uh, from their dialogue, there's the implication that he had a part in fathering it, even if it's just the removal of certain substances well, for it. It is. It is. He, he seems to, as he puts it, curiosity... But he has more of a tie to his progeny than is normally seen in this culture. They tend to think of birth and sex for procreation as lewd. Uh, You know, the idea of mothers and fathers as dangerous. These are dangerous ideas. So there's no family love. In fact, there's no real love as we understand it in the world of Logan's Run. It's more sexual satisfaction. It's hedonism. The big problem I had with Logan is that when you look at the face of it, he's not a very likable hero. I mean, he's pretty much a hypocrite. He's very content to do his job and takes pleasure in actually torturing the people that he's hunting yeah, down and toying I, with them. I, they're toying, just shooting at them, missing on purpose, hunting them down, laughing at them. But again, these people, they are children. They are all children, and it's a game. You know, life and death is a game. But then, of course, when it comes to apparently his turn to run, then it's different. Look, don't you understand? It's different now because it's me, my life. Help me. How can I? Where did you get that? I got it from a runner. And then you killed him, right? It was my job. But now... Now it's different. Believe me. I mean, I don't buy at that part that he is... I I think he's just putting on an act at that point. Well, that's where it gets a little confusing, as we'll get into down the road. I think it was one of the big problems with his character that we're not sure where he's coming from for a lot of the plot. Because the scene right before where he's dealing with the computer, it sounds like he actually is realizing that there is no renewal, that Carousel is the end. I did feel like that's what he got from the computer. He, He understood that Carousel is a lie, But they never find out why. And it's that why that bothers me, that they don't know why. It's very arbitrary. The other thing I realize is that when you look at it, Logan really doesn't do a heck of a lot in terms of the plot. A lot of things kind of happen to him Mm -hmm. and Jessica Six, but... He's a very passive character. Uh, There's only really one point, I think, that changes his character and kind of makes him a hero, and that's when they're on the outside and he decides they have to go back and try and warn people. And even then, although his intentions were good, 
he did bring down the entire city in a way that probably killed more people than would have died in Carousel. But he didn't even do it intentionally from what we can see. No, no, but I'm not even sure I would put him in hero status at that point. He's a very, he's a problematic hero. Well, for the heroism there is less from what he accomplishes and more for the fact that he's willing to take the risk of getting captured when he goes back to try and warn some people and save some lives. Mm -hmm. Whether he actually accomplishes it or not, I think the intention there makes him somewhat heroic. Okay. And there's not a heck of a lot else to grab onto with his character, so I'll I'll grab him where I can. (laughs) I feel as if Logan's run itself was more an exploration of the world that these people lived in now, rather than be about specific characters and empathizing with those characters it's more okay well we're gonna look at a possible future and these are all the wacky things that'll happen in this future very overarching themes and not really bringing it down to the people that it's focusing on which well i think the world building is great i think the lack of focus on character is kind of a mistake it is a mistake and like we said earlier I forgive this movie. Because <laughs> thankfully the world around it is so fascinating it is. and you want to explore it that, yes. that helps a lot. There, there are a lot of unanswered questions that I know we'll get into a little more in depth that I think instead of being a problem just lets us know how little of this world we know after having gone through the entire movie. Like, we we only know so much information, and the rest we can only speculate on, and that speculation works for me. Yeah, I'm fine with the ambiguity of that part of it, definitely. Uh, Next we have Jenny Agutter as Jessica Six. Uh, Agutter is known for performances in Walkabout, and for me, especially in American Werewolf in London. I love that one. She also appeared on the British spy show Spooks, and as it's known in England over here, it's MI5. And uh, recently she's appeared in The Avengers and Captain America the Winter Soldier. She'd actually work with Michael York again in The Riddle of the Sands and September. And supposedly Lindsay Wagner was one of the actresses originally considered for the part. I don't know Lindsay Wagner's acting style versus Jenny Agutter's style, but I think she was perfectly cast. I, she, yeah. she had just the right amount of pure innocence and total belief in other people just this she she really represented just everything that was pure and good about that culture that even though they were ignorant of a lot of things that ignorance uh for her anyway instead of leading to hedonistic pleasure became a deep kindness yeah, she has this wonderful naivety to her but also sort of this weird glamorous quality and the way those two Merge together is kind of odd. And unlike most of the other characters we see, we sense that throughout the whole story, even before we really get to know her, she's searching out for some kind of human connection. The fact she puts herself on the circuit, but she's not really interested in just quick sex. She's looking for something else after the loss of her friend, who's one of the runners that Francis and Logan kill in the opening scene. She's looking for a comfort she doesn't have the words for because this isn't what their culture does. I felt sad. I put myself on the circuit. It was a mistake. Sad? What do you feel sad about? A friend of mine went on carousel. Now he's gone. Yes, well, I'm I'm sure he was renewed. He was killed, like the others. Killed? Why do you why do you use that word? Isn't that what you do? Kill? I will say that she has the least amount of clothing to wear in this whole movie. And not just by volume, but it is very sheer. It is. It's literally transparent in a few scenes. Yes. She has on flesh-colored underwear for the later scenes because it never would have made it past censors without (laughs) the underwear. Next is Richard Jordan as Francis Seven. Jordan... uh, also starred in The Friends of Eddie Coyle. I played Dirk Pitt in Raise the Titanic. He was Duncan Idaho in Dune, of course. Yay. And had a nice role as uh, the National Security Advisor in The Hunt for Red October. 
William Devane was originally cast in the role, but dropped out at the last minute, and kind of a good thing because I'm not a huge William Devane fan, and I really like Richard Jordan in the part. He brings this kind of exuberant jock quality to Francis. This is a guy who just revels in what he's doing, and he loves it, and he doesn't want anything that's going to rock the boat or shake up his little narrow worldview of it. Yeah, he did not want anything that would break his idea of what the world was. I wish we had had more of Francis Seven in the movie, not just because Richard Jordan was a great actor and he was the perfect choice for uh, Francis, but I never felt like, like I didn't care at all that Logan and Jessica were in trouble with Francis. And I also, three quarters of the movie through, forgot Francis was still following them. <laughs> you should never, ever forget that they're being pursued by a villain. <laughs> Also, I think the relationship between Francis and Logan is stronger and more interesting than that between Logan and Jessica. Oh my gosh, yes. It was a bad bromance. All the the stuff he's doing where he shoots that other runner that uh, Logan allows to escape, where he's chasing them around, it's in a twisted way motivated by how much he cares for Logan, that he wants him back, he wants him to stick with the program and not go rogue. In fact, Logan also refused to engage with Francis because he didn't want to kill his friend, which is pretty much the first time we see any characters in this film have anything other than a sexual desire relationship. Friends, that's, I think, the only time we hear it is when Logan tells Jessica he's my friend. It's uh, pretty significant. I think it shows that Logan is looking for something that Jessica is also looking for. He's aware that there can be bonds. And as kind of a counterpoint to that, Francis also I think symbolizes the pure denial of the people living in the dome. That yeah. No matter what he sees when he actually gets to the outside, he's like, no, we have to go back in. That What's happening in the dome is all that exists for him, and he will deny, com- ruthlessly deny anything else that uh-huh. comes contrary to that. Now, I have to finish you. You are terminated, Runner. Francis, look at your palm. Go on. Look at it. Go on, look at it. It's true. This isn't the truth. This is a lie! Willful ignorance. Next one is Roscoe Lee Brown playing Box. Brown also appeared in Black Like Me, Alfred Hitchcock's Topaz, and I remember him as the nightclub mobster from the Mambo Kings. He also provided the voice for Winston Zeddemore's father on the real Ghostbusters cartoon, and narrated Babe, the movie about the talking pig. I love his voice. I'm really glad that he (laughs) narrated babe um i had a little trouble with the character box i I would like to unpack it at some point Mm -hmm. but it was confusing as to why he had to be this crazy machine and his name box what I mean, I understand they needed a way to tell everybody Sanctuary doesn't exist. You know, you can try as hard as you want to. You're not going to find Sanctuary. It felt very strange that the monster they would pick was a robot who displayed more emotion than the people inside the city. Overwhelming, am I not? Are you too startled? Am I too removed from your ken? What? Who are you? I'm more than machine, or oh man. More than a fusion of the two. Don't you agree? Wait for the winds. Then my birds sing and the deep Grottos whisper my name. Box, box, box. Well, one problem might be the design of it. I mean, he looks like a robot, but the dialogue suggests he's actually part human, part he, robot. That's the thing. It's it is the dialogue that's giving me trouble. If they had gotten to what they thought was sanctuary and it had been another human who had gone mad, I would have bought that. 
Well, one thing I, I like about Box is that he feels like kind of a, a smaller distillation of the city's computer system that's running everything, that he's this mechanism that's meant to preserve life, in this case to process food and store it for later usage by freezing it. But he's gone horribly wrong in his way, and he's just kind of trying to keep to his normal program and is actually killing people as a result rather than actually saving them. And I'm fine with that. It's just that he shows too much of a personality. I love the idea that he's sticking to his programming and he thinks, oh, these humans, they are meat. They're, they came from the water, therefore they are something I can process. It gives him something to do, it gives his uh, programming a purpose. But he has far too much of a devious nature. And deviance in that way is really only a human trait. I mean, he has subtext in the things that he says, he lies. So those things made his character not great for me. I'm not sure if he ever actually lies. He did. They might be considered white lies or selective truth-telling, but they're still lies yeah. about having seen other runners. Well, he has. <laughs> he has. He has, but they were very lies of omission. Because kind of like, oh, yes, I saw that. I saw that. Look at the birds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I didn't like him. The other thing about him, and I think this might go to the whole personality problem you're having with him, I wonder if he's also a reflection of the fact that he's been down there for thousands and thousands of years and has had the chance to actually develop this sort of work personality and this sense of art and artistry and concept of beauty while everybody in the city, who only lives to about the age of 30, doesn't really have that. In this sense that if they live longer, maybe they would develop these senses the way Box has. Hopefully a more healthy version of them, but... So you're asserting that Box has gained a level of sentience beyond his original programming? Oh, he's had to do something while he's it, kicking around there for thousands well, of years. Well, he's been freezing humans because it's the food coming from the sea. Uh, but he also does his sculptures, which I'm sure wasn't part of his programming. It was just something that he appears to really enjoy doing. I don't recall the sculptures. I mean, the birds mm -hmm. part, you know... Look, Listen to my birds. You can hear my birds. I think those were really frozen birds. They froze birds. Well, you can see along the whole stretch of the ice cave, there's like a uh, sculpture of a walrus. There's a sculpture of penguins. See, the, the penguins and the walrus I also thought were frozen creatures. I didn't think they were sculptures. No, they are. Because the, both of them come from the ocean, and he's very plankton, fish, protein, sea greens, and protein, protein from, from the, the sea. sea. So, yeah, I, I just assumed that they were frozen food. Well, also, as we'll get into, there's a scene that was cut out where we actually would have gotten to see him doing his sculpting. Yes. That would have made that a little bit more clear. Okay, next we have Farrah Fawcett, starring as Holly 13. Of course, Fawcett is known for her roles as Jill Monroe and Charlie's Angels and appeared uh, several times on The Six Million Dollar Man. Uh, she also appeared in the science fiction movie Saturn 3 and movies such as The Burning Bed, Extremities, and Small Sacrifices. This was actually still the period when she was married to Lee Majors, so she's Farrah Fawcett Majors for this one. And she's charming and kind of convincingly and often cartoonishly dim in this part. I forgive that. I had trouble with her character when I was younger and I didn't understand things uh, like the fact that so many of the characters were high all the time, and the characters were high all the time. We, we hope it's just the characters. Yes. So, the character of Holly, she seemed like she was stoned. I didn't necessarily think she was dim. I thought she was stoned out of her mind. I think the personality she presents, this kind of plastic hostess persona, works yeah. really great in the scene uh, with new, in New Year where he's getting the new face. It's but. wonderful. And I, I feel like that's the level she can function at. When um, she's gone through the trauma of the surgeon dying and having to run, and we find out that she is a member of Sanctuary. Of course she is, because the, the surgeon was also. Um, she has to be coached into remembering 
what really happened in a way that she could either be read as very, very stupid or how I read it, which was stoned. The other Sam man, remember? The one who came after. Oh, that's right. The other one came after. And he was hunting the first one. Wasn't he? Wasn't he? This one was running. And the other one was hunting him. Remember? Oh, yes. Yes. He was after you. I remember. You're running. I didn't think of the stoned possibility, but you are right, since a lot of the other characters aren't too much in the film. I'd like to believe that's the case. I remember seeing this in a movie theater, and that scene got huge laughs. It was really... Uh, it was a bit over the top, and I think if they'd established her as having done drugs, like even in, in the surgery room, if she'd taken a pill or something, that would have given us enough of a cue that she had been high rather than really badly acting. Also, it would have added a little suspense to the idea that Logan and Jessica's future hangs on this person who's not quite right in the head at that particular moment. Exactly. And has to remember that. I agree. It just seems like she seems a little shallow to be a member of this resistance group, considering the risks that they seem to be taking and everything. It, it doesn't totally jive with the way she performs the character. Not just that, but she seems to really, in, and if you take it from my point of view that she's stoned, she seems to really enjoy her life in the city. So it makes her a strange choice as a member, but it also makes them a strange choice for her. And next we come to one of my favorite performances in the movie, Peter Ustinov as the old man, which is the only way he's known. He doesn't actually get a name. Uh, Ustinov is known for his role as, I think I'm going to mispronounce this, Badiatis? I can't remember how you pronounce it, from uh, Spartacus. Uh, he was the voice of Prince John in the animated Robin Hood from Disney and played Hercule Poirot in several Agatha Christie adaptations. He actually worked with uh, Michael Anderson, the director, here several times, back when Anderson was an assistant director on Secret Flight and vice versa. And then he appeared in Anderson's directorial debut, Private Angelo. There's a photo of the old man in the movie that actually comes from his part in that movie. This kills me, though. The uh, actor considered for the part was James Cagney. Oh, I would have loved to have seen that. He was a little too old at that point. He didn't feel he was really up to the rigors of the role, but I love James Cagney. Seeing him play this would have been fantastic. But I do love Houston off in the part. I just think he's adorable. <laughs> he was wonderful in the film, and he showed what could happen to a person who'd been alive most of their life alone, but had been raised by a mother and a father and you know, had been out in the open, had not been doing drugs their whole life. Yet he was silly and he got off track. But I think we are supposed to read him, the old man, as a god figure. He is who, I mean, if, if we want to believe that they reach sanctuary at the end of their journey and they find this old man who is, I believe, dressed in white robes. Uh, brown robes. Brown robes. I still think that he is supposed to somewhat be our god figure. Or maybe in a different way, more concerning the way he's dressed, more of a prophet. That right, Since he gives yes. them the information of what was, at least what little information he has, and how people were are supposed to function and did function. Yes, exactly. I also love his unique way of speaking, the way he keeps mumbling, like... This is a guy who hasn't really spoken to another person, like you said, in so many years. He's almost forgotten how and how conversations are supposed to work. Yes. He just kind of rambles off into T.S. Eliot quotes. And he, he talks to his animals at the same time he's talking to someone else because he doesn't know that you need to catch the attention of the other person or tell them that you are speaking to them in one way or another. So he's just talking to the cat, but half of what he's talking about is to Logan. How did you get here? Well, I'm, I've always been here. Hello, Thomas. Are there any other people? Oh, gracious, no. 
Well, has uh, anyone else ever passed through here? Yeah. Oh, there may be a few out there. I don't know. No, I don't know. What makes you think that? Well, my parents tell me. My mother. And my, you know, the... Um, father. You knew your mother and father? Sure, they raised me. I, well, you know, I, 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 How have you grown? Inside your mother? Right there. Are you sure? Well, that's what she told me. I have to, I have to believe it. I don't know. People who are alone too much do talk like that. So I don't know how he developed this character, but he did a brilliant job of it. And in contrast to the citizens in the dome, we see that he has some sense of duty and responsibility to his elders and the people who came before. Yes. One of the big focuses of his scene is that he talks about how they bury the dead and makes Jessica promise to bury him once he's gone. Yes. And is very emphatic that she'd actually do that and keep up that promise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like they know why they would bury the dead, but it is an honorific. And it's kind of a continuation of a tradition. And tradition yeah. is one of the big elements of this movie. Next we come to the director, Michael Anderson. He also directed The Dam Busters, uh, the 1956 version of 1984, Around the World in 80 Days, Orca, and uh, <laughs> Millennium with Chris Christopherson. And he's the stepfather of Walking Dead actress Laurie Holden. Oh. Uh, apparently Anderson was actually really fond of making sci-fi movies, uh, commenting they offered the chance to create visuals that were hampered by normal reality and they allowed filmmakers more imagination. And he actually cast his son as uh, Doc in the movie, the, uh, the surgeon. surgeon in the oh, new wow. Year. That would explain some of Doc's not wonderful acting skills. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how much Anderson had to do with the production design. Gorgeous, gorgeous movie. Yes, the special effects are dated. Yes, the models don't hold up very well. But the overall design of the movie is just so compelling. And the design actually for the movie was by a guy named Dale Hennessy, who uh, he also designed Fantastic Voyage, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, and Dirty Harry. And um, that explains it. <laughs> yeah, interesting that you it's get quite the a kind resume. Of, and you get the two extremes there: Dirty Harry with the you know grimy crime of the 1970s, and movies like Fantastic Voyage where everything is clean and sterile and perfect. Yeah, so you yeah. get the extremes of it. This is right before kind of Star Wars changed science fiction and everything became used up and dirty and dingy looking when everything was clean and elegant futurism. Yeah. And it's kind of the, one of the last ones to do that for a while until uh, the Star Trek movies made it popular again. Mm -hmm. The script was written by David Zelag Goodman. He also wrote several episodes of the Untouchables TV series, as well as the screenplays for Straw Dogs, Farewell, My Lovely, and he co-wrote The Eyes of Laura Mars. Three movies I have not seen two of them being on my movies to see at some point list so I've seen straw dogs i haven't seen the other two <laughs> i haven't seen straw dogs but there was a lot of uproar when the remake was made and as often as possible i try to see the original before i see the remake so i held off and just have not been able to get a hold of a copy of the original it's definitely good stuff heavy but very good Unfortunately, the script is where I think a lot of this movie falls down and that character motivations, as we mentioned, are pretty thin when they're even yeah, there. Yeah, I, I, I haven't read the original novel, or was it a short story? It was a novel, yeah, neither have I, unfortunately. Um, so I wonder how much of it had to do with adapting the material? From what I understand, they only took the very basic idea and okay. changed it around and moved, put it in a different direction. But It felt like a script that bit off more than it could chew. It feels like it really needs a lot more of character development, especially the yeah. relationship between Logan and Jessica, which is so important to the story, really feels undercooked. Yes. It feels like she develops feelings for him way too quickly. Um, the idea that she trusts him, I can understand that to some degree, but it seems to go beyond trust very quickly. I do think that some of that problem has to do with sexism in science fiction, and especially that era. The heroines always fall for the heroes really quickly, and they need rescuing, and they're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and it felt very much like the typical, I fell in love with this man no matter how much of an asshole he is, because for most of it, Logan's, Logan's a jerk. He is. 
And yeah. I can almost see the points where her character change is supposed to happen. Like, at first, it, she just gets the assignment. Once she tells her other people in the underground, they're like, no, we have to kill him. And we see it's just a matter of she's reluctant to actually have this guy killed. And then once she sees him let the runner go, that seems to be the turning point for her, where she completely trusts him. And okay, I can buy that. But once it turns to love, it just... That's very yeah, far. Yeah, we, we never see a moment, not even a moment where she looks at him and you can tell she loves him. And th- there was absolutely nothing he did to make her love him. Like, from the outside, it would have looked very strange. And on the flip side, uh, the same thing, we never really see a point where Logan would really fall for her, no. besides the fact she's Jenny Agutter. Uh, it seems like his feelings for her are one of the real big motivations for him actually turning and going off mission and becoming a runner and yet we never get that moment the well, closest we get is the moment where he tries to send her back before the other Sandmen infiltrate the resistance organization and kill everybody but we never really see the point that brought him there plus you know we we don't understand when he changed when his character went from a Sandman to a undercover runner to a runner we can assume at the moment that sanctuary is infiltrated the change is supposed to happen there but we never see nothing nothing makes him change because he he might send her away or attempt to send her back to the city but that doesn't show love per se it could have been tactics, but because that part is never really worked out. Yeah, that's another really big problem with the screenplay for me. Now, if they were playing it on purpose that we're not supposed to know what side Logan is on for a lot of the movie, that might have worked. But the way it's presented, it really feels like we're supposed to believe he is genuinely running. That he is, yes. That he has lost faith in the system, that he doesn't believe in renewal anymore, and mm-hmm. he's willing to go. So that moment where he actually hits the button and summons the other Sandman, I remember watching that the first time and being like, what the hell is he doing? Yes. It, there was no indicator he was still on mission at that point. So yep. I had a real, real trouble with that. It We really only needed a line or two or you like a moment where he and Francis share a, a look or anything. Yes, just a moment of him telling Francis, don't worry, everything's going to be fine, just give me a few days. Right. Anything. Which would have been smart right. <laughs> of Logan to do. Or even if they wanted to take that out, have Francis follow him, and it's Francis who calls in the authorities once he sees what's going on. Yes. Just something. But the way they play it, it it's such a shock, and it suddenly forces us to reevaluate him in a way that it's a little too late for that. And he never really... The way the film is now, we never really get him actually copping to that or expressing remorse. We'll mm-hmm. get into that a little bit where that should have been in the film. But... That's one of the big, big flaws I have that really takes me out of the story, unfortunately. Uh, Moving from the script, the cinematography is by Ernest Laszlo, who photographed movies such as DOA, Stalag 17, Kiss Me Deadly, Judgment at Nuremberg, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, and Ship of Fools, for which he won the Oscar. Certainly shoots a very pretty-looking movie. DOA being the movie I remember the best out of all of these... It is a very pretty movie, and the color balance feels right. I don't think he was doing anything groundbreaking in this movie, but I'll take pretty out of this movie over something daring, because everything else was pushing really hard. Uh, the music score is by Jerry Goldsmith once again. We talked about this a little bit on the Total Recall episode, how Goldsmith would use electronic instruments whenever he's doing a futuristic score, and it's interesting that for all the scenes inside the city, he mostly uses electronic instruments uh-huh. with a little bit of strings and keyboards, and it's not until the moment where they actually step outside into the sun that we have a full orchestral arrangement of the score, yes. and it turns to orchestra from that point on. I think that's a really great kind of subtle touch to clue the uh, viewer into the change in the plot. And uh, that guy, he just came up with the most amazing melodies. I love Goldsmith's work. He's not a composer I would have been able to pick out of a lineup before I started examining this stuff. Let's talk about the costume design by Bill Thomas. Okay, it's a science fiction movie. Do they have spandex or do they have togas? In Logan's run, you get both. Thomas worked on a lot of Disney movies, such as The Parent Trap and The Black Hole, as well as Touch of Evil and It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. 
there's one touch I never noticed until I, this was pointed out to me recently that the colors that everybody is wearing in the dome actually represent the color of their life clock. That's sort of what I figured, but we didn't see a lot of variation in color, so I wasn't sure. Like we never, I don't think we ever see a yellow. Well, we do see a we little do? bit of yellow. Okay, I, I may have just not seen one when I was looking for yeah, it. It's mostly greens and shades of red. Yeah, but. greens and reds, but um, because there are so many different shades, mm-hmm. I just assumed that was their color palette. And of course the Sandmen are dressed in black and gray, which yes. makes them nicely representative of death and has them stand out, too, that in any crowd you can look and see the Sandman popping up. Well, not just that, but when the characters turn 30, they're, the gem that's lodged into their hand turns black. So... They represent, the, the Sandman rather, represent with the color black that they are, that's your choice, Carousel or them. Either way, you are going to be done in by that black gem in your hand. We talked about Jenny Agutter's costumes, or lack thereof. Yes, yeah, her lack of costume. A lot of his work looks like it would really fit on Star Trek. This is the kind of stuff guest stars Absolutely. on Star Trek would wear all the time. Very early next generation. When it came to the scene in Logan's apartment when he's prowling for sex on the circuit, that robe that he's wearing was actually thrown together in a few hours. Really? He was supposed to be wearing his normal Sandman uniform, and both the director and Thomas didn't really feel it fit the scene. So while they were lighting, Thomas grabbed a few bolts of cloth left over from the other Sandman outfits and threw that together, and Michael York still has it, apparently, in his closet. Oh, that's great. It's a nice little outfit, considering it was thrown together at the last second. Uh, Let's talk a few facts about the production. The city scenes were actually filmed in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, uh, including the Fort Worth Water Gardens and the Dallas Market Center. The main area, the main mall that uh, Carousel takes place and everything, is actually a trade show complex. Really? So, Well, it looks like a mall. It was actually just for exhibitions and things like that. And that area is actually where John F. Kennedy was going to visit when he was shot in Dallas during his assassination. That's where he was about to give a speech. Yeah. By shooting it there, it almost feels like it kind of predicted mall culture. You have all the young people gathering in this area where they can eat, where they can shop, where they can do whatever. In this case, get sex or hallucinogenics if they feel the need. Right. This sort of perception of you know, mall culture is these shallow kids who don't really have any responsibility or anywhere, anything to do or actually any work to do. I didn't um, make the connection between Logan's Run and mall culture, but that's a good one. Uh, The film was originally going to be produced by George Powell, the guy who brought us uh, War of the Worlds and the Time Machine, which I would have been really interested to see the movie he would have made out of this. Me too. Then after that, it was going to be Irwin Allen, who produced The Poseidon Adventure and Towering Inferno, but... He was right in the middle of his disaster phase, and he kind of put it underneath those. So uh, Saul David, the producer who had actually brought it to Alan's attention, decided to produce it himself. Uh, let's get into some of the many themes and symbols and meanings of the plot. Of course, one of the big ones is youth culture and youth as opposed to, well, the now non-existent elders. Yes. The culture of youth went so far as major reconstructive plastic surgery when people either tired of their face or their body or they wanted to upgrade to a younger model. You've got to remember that these characters don't ever turn 30. So they're in their 20s. They are in the peak of their beauty and they think they need to have surgery to look younger. It it really just puts an emphasis on how much a culture values youth and beauty, how our culture does that. It was really it's like that moment you're watching a film and it just kind of hits you and you're like, oh, it's awful. <laughs> we also end up seeing this youth culture that's kind of frozen in amber. I mean, because they don't go up to 30 and beyond, they never really get to a point where they need to struggle or have any responsibility or yes. they need to strive for anything better. I mean, the only thing that keeps them from totally stagnating is the fact that they're ritualistically killed by mm-hmm. during Carousel. They also, um, they're raised by robots, so they're not raised even by older city dwellers. So they don't form bonds with humans the way that children are supposed to bond with, say, their mother or, you know, their their parental unit. All of them, they are most likely sociopaths. 
Well, we can see that when we get to meet the cubs, the younger ones, before they go green and are worked into the city population, that they're pretty much like the Lost Boys. They're wild, they're running around, beating people up. Yeah, and we find that they are the young people of mind and body since they are prior to 30. And when they go outside the city with the old man, he's old. He is really old. He, and probably not even really old by our standards. He's probably in his 60s. Yeah, but, but they've never seen anybody have wrinkles or white hair or, you know, uncomfortable walking or anything like that. These people, their idea of age is just, um, it's not even anything to them. They're just, they know that once they get 30, they die, and that's the end of their life. They have no idea that there's there are physical changes. Well, we can see it when Logan sees the, the Lincoln Memorial for the first time and goes, that must be what being old looks like. He's yes. never seen a face like that before. Yes. Which also to me is a horrific scene because you realize Abraham Lincoln and everything he strove for, everything humanity and mankind has strove for, whoosh, out the window. Yeah. They've totally forgotten it. They cannot grow from history because they have no concept of it. There's a very big theme of freedom and slavery, and especially with Logan at the end, you've got, you know, Abraham Lincoln, and he mentions Abraham Lincoln again in conversation with the old man, or as an aside, and saying something about how that's a man he would have wanted to talk to, or I don't remember exactly yeah. what it was. But Logan ends up being the person who goes back and frees the people who, by the way, and I don't know if you noticed this at all, this movie was so white it hurt. <laughs> I didn't see even, I, I didn't see anybody who would, would have just been a tanned white person. I come to think of it, I don't think I saw any anybody of color either. Right. That's unfortunately, kind of typical for this period, which is a shame. But it's very much a shame because it feels when we get the comparison to Abraham Lincoln and the freeing of slaves of their type, it doesn't have the resonance that it should because it just it seems like an appropriation. Yeah, well that was another, that's something that's unfortunately kind of prevalent in sci-fi too. Not a lot of, certainly not a lot of meaningful black characters for a while during this period, but sometimes none at all. Which gives a pretty scary image of the future for African Americans watching this. Yes. Another thing I thought was curious about the fact that it cuts off at 30, we get this sense that we're not sure what exactly happened to the Earth. There's hints of wars and population and things like that. And of course, once they actually get to the outside world to get to Congress, which of course was traditionally associated with you know old white men in power. Yes. So it almost makes me wonder if part of the reason for the cutoff at 30 that the computer systems in the city have is to sort of prevent that from happening again. The sense that these old white guys, they were responsible for everything that happened, so we'll cut them off at 30 before they can actually get to a point where they could get into power or even have the idea of getting into power and that way preserve the status quo. It's almost a, either a punishment or maybe a preventative measure. Well, what I have also wondered about Logan's Run, how did those cities get built? Who built them? Who programmed the robots? My th private theory is that the denizens of the city were a social experiment. They were given these constraints uh, and they lived by them, and I believe they would have been observed or studied in one way or another. It's the only way I can fathom that all of these structures got built after such a major disaster, and the robots were so sophisticated. I can't imagine it happening any other way. And the only way I can also think of that they survived is that they were cut off. Maybe it was uh, almost constructed as sort of an arc. Some group that decided, all right, this is the only way that humanity survived, and we'll have to make these cutoffs that nobody over 30, and they set up a computer to preserve that and keep the status quo. 
That also is very, very possible. I think the big prevailing theme of the movie is about religion. Yes. Which is all over the place. I mean, Carousel itself kind of becomes this belief system. It offers a concept of the afterlife and incorporates elements of other religions like reincarnation. That Mm -hmm. if you manage to get through Carousel, you'll be renewed and become a baby again and keep going. And keeps the population happy. And even Carousel itself, I mean, it has all the pageantry that we see of religion. It's this giant ritual. Everyone gets dressed up. Dressing in robes, Mm -hmm. no less. And if you look at the outfits that they wear, it's like the top is white, the bottom is red flames, which, granted, it probably seems to more indicate the idea of, you know, getting blown up during Carousel. Well, there's the purification by fire idea. But also, I I looked at it and immediately saw heaven and hell. White heaven, hell flames. But... The carousel, it was so theatrical in a way. And a a lot of religious ceremonies, like really formal ceremonies, do have theatrics. But yes, carousel was definitely, we believe with fervor. These are the fanatics. Even the fact that it's held in what looks like a coliseum with people chanting. Yes. So we've got the illusion of religion with carousel because... We know as viewers that it is false. It is a false belief system. We explore through Jessica a different type of belief that sanctuary exists. Sanctuary becomes our heaven. We will find sanctuary. We will get there. I believe it is there. Even to the point where it's represented by another religious object, in this case an Egyptian an one, the Ankh. Right. A symbol for everlasting life. Yep. Yeah. And of course that turns out to be just as false as Carousel in the end. Well, it, it does, but in the meantime we have Logan who, while he stumbled on the Ankh, goes through a literal journey with Jessica and at one point becomes a convert. In our big metaphor here, he would have been our atheist. He believed in Carousel, but when he realized that Carousel was not real, he didn't believe. In fact, there's a a great speech about it not being there, about sanctuary not existing, and the context could have been replaced with heaven. Heaven is not real. The afterlife is not real. God is not real. We are going on, aren't we? There's nothing to go on to, Jessica. The sanctuary. There is. You want there to be one, but that doesn't... It has to be. I know it exists. So it no, has to No, be. it does. Not, not really. Just, just so many people want it to exist. So, so many people who don't want to die. They, they, they want it so much that a place called sanctuary becomes real. But, but it doesn't exist. It never existed. Just... Just the hope. People need something to believe and yes, or will yes. find something or make something. And even when Logan and Jessica get out of the dome, all I could think was when they're wandering around trying to find a place, some kind of shelter, it's Adam and Eve. It's spelled from paradise. It is absolutely expulsion from the garden. In fact, it's to the point that when they get out into nature, one of the first things that we really see them do as a couple is dive into a pool and basically they they have sex Mm -hmm. you know the expulsion from the garden exploration of bodies we can assume i mean they even show interest at least jessica does in becoming a mother there's a new awareness of themselves and their mortality they're not children anymore they have grown past that they might not know everything but they are definitely not children. And they have a desire now for something more, yes. something beyond themselves. Yes. And finally we come to what seems like almost a deus ex machina, when the computer is doing its bizarre surrogate holographic interrogation of Logan, and basically blows itself up because it refuses to believe what Logan yes. is telling it. <laughs> it. It had some sort of belief conflict that would not allow itself to continue existing. (laughs) It's like what Logan is telling it about, you know, what Box was actually doing, that there is no sanctuary, runs against its dogma, and it just, it can't abide that. Input contrary. Input contrary. 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 May may not, may not, may not resist. May not resist, Logan 5. Unacceptable. 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 Does not... 
And that's another thing we didn't really touch on when it came to the computer. The computer believed in Sanctuary, deeply believed that Sanctuary existed. New Carousel was false, totally believed in Sanctuary. So we have the computer that believes the same thing as Jessica, but his desire is to, or I'm personifying the computer, its desire was to infiltrate and destroy it. So in this scenario, the computer is our devil. I, I don't want to say the trickster because it is doing a heck of a lot more than trick. Uh, I do love how pissy it gets when Logan keeps pushing it. Question. Nobody reach for no? But... Everybody believes that, that some... The question has been answered, Logan Five. You mean nobody's ever been renewed? The question has been answered. <laughs> or maybe the fact that it doesn't regard uh, sanctuary in quite the same religious terms that Jessica and the Resistance does, it just sees it as a problem. Yes, but the idea that it believes sanctuary exists so strongly that it would destroy itself over a contradiction leads me to believe that it was more than that it had a belief system maybe it wasn't just the fact that sanctuary doesn't exist but the fact that it sees what's actually outside the dome through logan's memories and that's what really drives it nuts the fact that it has to deal with there is an outside world now that it's just not been programmed to actually deal with in any way right let's get to some of the little trivia bits all right, here's a big one. Uh, several scenes had to be cut down, either for time or to retain a PG rating. A section of the chase where Logan and Jessica and Francis run through the sex shop had to be cut down. You can see it in the movie that one second, Logan and Jessica are on opposite sides of the room, all of a sudden, boom, they're running up together. Yeah, and we didn't talk about the sex shop yet, because that's, that's part of the movie I missed somehow as a child. <laughs> I remember when I first saw it being like, I can't believe this got a PG rating. There is a whole lot of nudity in this yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. I, the drugs floating down from the ceiling, bodies everywhere, like people trying to wrangle in two unwilling participants. So there is a an attempted rape. And I, I did think it was interesting that it's members of both genders grabbing both Logan and yes. Jessica. But... And something we didn't talk about about the sex shop scene they enter the sex shop and you can view it as sort of like a sexual awakening I mean, because they're being torn away from each other and they want desperately to go to each other. And we can assume that they're being affected by these drugs because the cinematography in this case is a little foggy and weird. And there's the use of slow motion and the yes, distorted sound. Yeah. yeah, so you can tell that they're, they're becoming connected in a different way. They leave the sex shop through a door with a big vaginal shape on it. I mean, there is a vulva staring right at you, and they go through it. So we can consider that scene a, a rebirth. They have been renewed by their journey out. I just keep thinking the, the image of that, the neon vagina, that sounds like it should be a band name. It was totally neon. <laughs> Beyond that, so a couple key scenes I think that should have been kept in is one where Francis runs into sort of an old flame of his who's about to go through Carousel. And there's some dialogue that would have indicated how Carousel works, the fact that you actually have to get to the top to supposedly be renewed. But also this idea that she's like, well... If I don't, maybe maybe I should just get blown up. That would be a big thrill, wouldn't it? This idea that they're so jaded and bored now that yeah. they don't really value life to that degree that, yeah, maybe I'll just get blown up. That scene would emphasize the vulgar joy Sandman got out of hunting other people. They had tried every thrill. They had done everything. Nothing had consequences, and they had to just keep upping the adrenaline rush. They needed more and more endorphins. They were junkies. Yeah. The big one, though, and this is kind of a notorious scene, is when Logan and Jessica end up in Box's cavern, where originally he 
wouldn't show them where the other runners had gone unless they posed for a nude sculpture. And it was during this scene, while Logan and Jessica are posing, they actually have a conversation where Logan admits to Jessica that he is the one who sent the signal that brought all the other Sandman in, and actually does express some kind of remorse for it. That was the plan. I've been ordered to find out where the runners have gone to. To locate this sanctuary. Destroy them. That's why I brought in the sand that would kill the fire. Just for you. Yes, can you? You don't know that it was my fault. Yes. And now you're one of us. I really wish they had kept that scene in. That's I, it's a tiny bit. It's not half of what it needed for the character, but at least it was something. And it's also the moment where he confesses that now he is kind of a runner, mostly because of his feelings for her. That he doesn't understand what he's feeling for her, but he knows he needs her. I have conflicting feelings about the scene. I feel like something like that could have been used a little earlier. We didn't need that scene. But because it didn't... We didn't get that earlier. That little bit of conversation really would have helped his character. I think more scenes with Fox would have been detrimental to the movie as a whole. Well, that and I do like in that original scene, there would have been a nice moment where he's talking about the ice sculpture. You, you'll be preserved forever, frozen. And of course... As a double meaning once we know what he's actually going to do to them once they're finished posing. The last notable little extra bit is originally there was a moment where, while the old man is pointing out all the portraits of the original presidents, there was one of Nixon. He goes, this one, known as Tricky Something, I can't remember what, which they decided to cut out because it was still a little too close to Watergate. (laughs) Too soon. (laughs) Too soon. Too soon. In the original book, the last day for everybody in the dome was actually 21. They decided to raise it up to 30 for the movie because it was felt... Trying to hire actors around 20, they probably wouldn't be able to carry the movie. I think that was wise. 21, though? I want to know what the reason for that cutoff was. 30, I understand, because that's typically when we, in society now, consider ourselves adults. It could be, and I know the 70s weren't that far back from us, But it could be that 21 was more adulthood, and that's why that was the cutoff. When was the book written, anyway? Um, I want to say the mid-60s? Yeah, I I think it would have more to do with 21 being considered an adult. Uh, What's funny is that both Michael York and Richard Jordan were over 30 when they played their role, so they would have actually ridden Carousel by then. A couple other little notes. During the big shootout when the Sandmen are infiltrating the Resistance, you can notice there's one extra runs by with his ass lit on fire. Which always makes me laugh. I had never noticed it until I, I, I heard about it recently in a podcast and I had to check it out. God, that's... And now I can't not look at it during the middle of that scene, this big, heavy, dramatic scene. It's almost impossible to see on camera, but the buttons on the old man's coat are actually pennies. Really? Like he scratched up whatever he could to repair his coat and that's all he could find. Also, that money is meaningless. Yeah, that now it's being used for a much more Decoration, practical purpose. Decoration, yeah. yeah. To actually keep his coat closed and keep him warm. And uh, during the last scene, when all the population of the dome is actually coming out to meet the old man, you can see one of them in the background actually gives the live long and prosper sign. Oh, I did not see that. I'll I don't have know to if, watch that scene again. I don't know if he was hoping nobody would notice and just wanted to throw in a little joke, but... So he photobombed? Pretty much. <laughs> Let's talk about the legacy of the movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nolan would go on to write several sequels to the original book following the success of the movie once it had gotten back into the public consciousness. I did not know that. Uh, It also inspired a TV series in the 1970s. only lasted 14 episodes, but still kind of a cult hit. And there have been a lot of comic book series since then. And I don't think there's any way to get around it. There's a huge influence on the young adult dystopia genre that we've seen. I mean, there's Divergent, The Giver, even The Hunger Games. I think a lot of them actually do take from this story. I think the idea of youth as being a significant part of it, the the struggle between youth and older people, other generations. Besides that, there is a very rich history spanning back now over a hundred years for dystopia that 
most of those I think would have drawn more from, but I think there there was a bit of influence, yeah. Well, definitely the sense of youth struggling against the system, but also being pushed into very rigid parameters of the society, that you have to die at 30, that you have to, in the case of Divergent, follow this particular life path. Right. In the case of Hunger Games, that you have to conform to what your district does and mm -hmm. to the rules of these uh, nasty games that they do. I think, though, one of the features of dystopian fiction is that society has rules, rules must be followed. And the dystopian part is that those rules are so different from our own real world, but they explore real aspects of humanity and human interconnectedness that was missing, actually, from Logan's run. But there's also this idea of the dystopia hidden behind a utopia, that in the case of something like Divergent, for example, we see the system and we're told it works perfectly, everything's great, but of course we start to see underneath the surface that there are bad things happening. Yes. It's the case here. There have actually been several attempts to remake the movie, which I actually think this is one that would be right for a remake. I think you could take a lot of the ideas in this and take them in different directions, maybe with a little bit more dramatic skill than was done in this particular one. I am so tired of remakes that if they remade it, I would not see it. I would. I Because, I, again, I think, A, it sounds like it's not very close to the original book, so a more faithful adaptation might be something different, but... Again, I, I look at this and I think there's a lot of great stuff in there, but it, I think it could be done. There is a better. lot of great stuff, but if it were to be remade now, it would be billed as a thriller. It would feel a lot like the movie The Island. Which a lot of people have said that that movie rips this one off, although... I don't think it was a rip-off. No, I think there are it some... It was a rip-off, but not of Logan's Run. It was a rip-off of the Clonus Exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> although I still like parts of the island, to be honest. I did too, but it has a different tone than this movie did. <laughs> and I feel like, especially because there's been such a renaissance for all things quote-unquote nerd-slash-geeky... I feel like this movie would get an enormous budget and have gloss all over it. And that can be great for some movies. And I think a remake of Logan's Run would make everybody a lot of money. But I just don't think I want it to look so veneered. I mean, e even in this, we saw the wire work for the people who are in Carousel. The models were very obviously models. When we saw a really great matte painting, we both remarked, what a wonderful <laughs> matte painting. <laughs> and that part, that era of time, when you got a combination of things like wire work and models, and, and you got a tiny little bit of computer animation with the hand gems. I don't think they actually glowed. Oh, no, they I th did. They did, actually. You can see a couple shots where there's a wire going oh, into okay. Michael York's. Was there a little bit of manipulation, computer manipulation? No, they wouldn't really have had it then. If they no. did anything, they would have done cell animation probably to manipulate it. But. Oh, good point. It was cell animation at that time. I don't know if there was any. I didn't see. I don't think so. I think it was mostly practical, practical with the effects. wires. I mean, they were even doing stuff like that on Doctor Who around the same well, time. Well, not so. just the wires, but the surgery scene. Oh, that yeah, that, that, that would be animation. Well, that was cell animation for the last Okay, movie. I thought so. So they do have some animation yeah, as well. Do. Okay. I feel like those things, it's part of this type of sci-fi. It, it feels very pulp fiction. There was an era of a glut of science fiction, short stories, and pulpy books, and a certain amount of space opera cheesiness that came with it. And this era, the, the 70s science fiction era, has the same feeling to me, where I, I feel if you divorce it from the tone of that time, you lose something. Possibly. I do think it could be adapted to a slightly different tone, but... Oh, it definitely could be adapted to a slightly different tone, but I don't want to see that. For me, it would depend on what they would do with the story. Like I said, that's one area where I think this film falls down that another film could actually improve upon a little bit. Make the characters work a little better than they do here. Anyway, for the remake, uh, for a while, Brian Singer was attached to direct it. Nothing came of that. 
Uh, recently, uh, Nicholas Winding Refn, the director of Drive, has been pursued for it. For a little while there, uh, Ken Levine, the creator of Bioshock, was actually attached to write the script. That would have made me incredibly happy. Because he, he actually cited Logan's Run as a big influence on his stuff, especially the Bioshock Yes. Uh, can I take back right now that I would not see a Logan's Run remake? In fact, I would see a Logan's Run remake if Levine was attached. Well, I'm not sure if he's still part of the project I know. at this point. I said if. I have my condition. The last thing I heard was actually they were talking about changing it so to make it actually a female protagonist now. Feels a little pandering. Could be. Just have to say that. <laughs> it, Again. It feels a little like pandering. I mean, it, Logan's run, and I know the name Logan can be either gender, but <sighs> try harder. It would, for me, it would depend Write on... new stories featuring women. Don't gender swap just because it'll be good and... <laughs> More people will see it. For me, it would depend on how they would handle it, but yeah, I I definitely think there's a possibility of that one. Being done because it's felt it's popular. I mean, we have Hunger yeah. Games and Jennifer Lawrence and Katniss. We need a female character like that to cover it. Yeah. yeah. Footage of the city exteriors from this movie was reused as scenery outside of windows on Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh. In uh, Tapestry, the one where Captain Picard gets a chance to relive his big mistake. Yeah. And you'll love this. It also appeared for a couple shots in Ice Pirates. Yeah. I love that movie. All right, now here's the coolest part. Uh, it actually inspired a street game in San Francisco uh, last year. They actually held this thing where people could sign up as runners or sandmen. They'd have to wear the outfits that they could put them together. They got their little life clock in their palm and would run around and try and catch each other. I didn't know that existed. Some friends That's of mine. Had, amazing. Some friends of mine had actually proposed that for uh, a nearby convention a couple of years ago, and then I immediately volunteered. I'll be box, but. <laughs> Okay, do you have a favorite scene from the movie? My favorite scene of the movie absolutely just has to be Carousel. It, it is ridiculous. And it's frightening. It is really scary because you go in to the scene of Carousel and you don't know what's going to happen. And everybody's getting really worked up into a fever pitch and the stage starts spinning slowly and then all of a sudden people are flying and you're like they're flying okay this is fine but then they start exploding and it's terrifying because the people below are cheering and It's like on Game of Thrones where the red woman is burning people alive and her followers are just cheering it on because they believe so fully. And the appearance of them, at first they come out in these very creepy monks-like yes. robes. Take them off and they're wearing leotards but with goalie masks from the 70s so you can't you even see their see, faces. You, you don't see the horror of their faces in death. They're dehumanized. They're, yes. They're not allowed to be people in this last moment. And that voice, the computer voice coming up. Be strong and you will be renewed. Which we know is a complete lie. Right. It probably is just in place to prevent more people from running. Mm-hmm. Clunky as it is, my favorite might be the box scene, but specifically the moment where we find out what actually happened to all those other runners, when Box opens up this wall and we see they're just frozen. How did they get there? Regular storage procedure. The same as the other food. The other food stopped coming, and they started. What other food? Fish, and plankton, and sea greens, and protein from the sea. It's all here, ready, fresh as harvest day. Fish and plankton, sea greens and protein from the sea. And then it stopped coming, and they came instead. So I store them here. I'm ready, and you're ready. It's my job to freeze you. That was a shocking moment. And what's creepy about it is that it's also kind of beautiful in this weird way. You have all these beautiful people, and they're not posed in these poses of horror. They just look very neutral, almost like they're mannequins in the shop window. Mm -hmm. And there are all these 
perfectly beautiful, athletic, naked people just posing this way. It almost looks like a, some kind of weird display, like it's part of his art. But that also was very disturbing, because if they had gone through Carousel, they were going to die. If they ran and they were caught, they were going to die. If they ran and went as far as they could towards Sanctuary, they were going to die. It didn't matter. They were either going to burn or they were going to freeze. I didn't even notice that, the fact that it is the two polar opposites. Yeah. But, but also this idea that their whole struggle comes down to this. They're stuck in this block of ice for pretty much all eternity, and no one will ever know what actually happened to them. Right. It's one of those cases where they filmed a scene that's set in an ice cavern. It was filmed on the hottest day of the year. Ugh. So all those extras basically Ugh. had to stand completely still in these little ice box, probably with a light right over their heads, which would have made them sweat, while wearing makeup. And through that whole scene had to remain absolutely still. I wasn't even thinking of I was thinking of the actor inside of Box. That would have been miserable. Which actually was Roscoe Lee Brown. He wasn't just doing the voice, he was in the suit. Was the voice looped in? I assume so, but he was actually in the suit performing. Yeah. You can actually see when he speaks behind the Yes! I saw that. You can see his teeth and you can see his lips sometimes when he's talking. I tried Something that could have easily been fixed with a little bit of black cloth or nowadays with some computer generated altering but it added to the creepiness I I kind of attributed to the half human part of it that there's like biological components underneath well what I was thinking also by this mistake because it's a mistake there's the thought that perhaps Box really is human had gone insane considered himself a god of sorts and donned computer parts. Maybe to keep himself know. alive over thousands yes. of years. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I could go a million different ways with this, but it was a mistake and we weren't supposed to see that. But we can fix it. <laughs> we can rationalize we can, it. <laughs> we can make it okay with our imaginations. Well, the bigger problem is the fact that every time he moves around his cavern, you can see the film crew reflected yeah, inside. Yeah, which is not something I noticed until this last time, but it's pretty wonderful. It's, uh, it's, once you see it, it's pretty hard not yeah. to see it. Okay, do you have any movies you'd recommend if people like this one? Or maybe if they don't like it, something you think might work better. Do I? (laughs) Okay, this is going to be one of those situations where I have several movies, so bear with me. let it rip. If you liked Logan's Run, you absolutely have to see Barbarella. You've got the same kind of space opera feel to it, a very sexually charged story science fiction movie, elements of ridiculousness. It's it's what you're going to want to see if you love Logan's Run. If you like the dystopian ideas, but weren't thrilled with Logan's Run as it is, you could go several different ways. You could do Gattaca, which is almost the dark drama version of dystopia. And that's with Ethan Hawke and Jude Law. Just a wonderful movie. Also with Uma Thurman. Or you could go more to the silly side and see what we had just referenced earlier, The Island, with Scarlett Johansson and Ewan McGregor. And two really big stars in a it's not a goofy movie, but it's much the its tone is a little brighter than Gattaca. There is a glut of dystopian film out there, so just type in movie and dystopia and watch it and I'm sure that uh, it will have some connection to Logan's Run. Well, I'm going to throw in a couple more of the dystopian ones. Uh, one that always strikes me watching this one is the Francois Truffaut version of Fahrenheit 451. Yes. Where again you have a character who's kind of an enforcer in this rigid society who is led to question his beliefs and his role in the system and actually turns against it. Plus that's, I just love the way that movie's put together. That's such a great story. It's funny you mentioned Gattaca because actually the one I was going to recommend is from the same director, Andrew Nichol, uh, but his later one, not quite as polished and a bit more heavy-handed, called In Time with Justin Timberlake and Amanda Seyfried. I did not see that. Similarly to this one, it deals with a system where it kind of the lack of resources is resolved through the unnatural death of young members of society. There, 
everybody has been frozen at around the age of 25 to 27, mm -hmm. but their lifespan is now basically currency. They have this clock in their arm, cut very similar to the clock in the palm of their hand, that keeps track of how much time they have left, and they basically spend it, they can work for it. Oh. And it's divided amongst the population. Of course, there are some who have but that, thousands of years right. on their clocks, and some who have one day. Well, be it becomes elitist at that point. You have to have a lot of currency in order to gain more currency, or you have to have products to sell to people who need those products and you sell it for more time that's mm -hmm. insane and I love it and similar to this movie they have an enforcer in that one that's similar to the Sandman uh, called the Timekeeper played by Killian Murphy who runs around and goes after those people who are breaking the rules I need to see that movie it's very silly and kind of clunky but like this movie it explores the dimensions of that society to a lot of interesting detail. There is one other movie that's name is escaping me and perhaps you know what it is. I would say it's dystopian. People have lost their ability to feel pain. It might be. Or to feel anything. I that can't. actually might be the next one that was on my list, Equilibrium? Yes. With Christian Bale. Yes. Yeah. Where the population is controlled by drugs and lose touch with their history and character. And when he stops taking the medication that's supposed to dull his feelings, he actually starts thinking outside of the box and trying to connect with this resistance movement. It could be that one. Um, the only scene I remember was... And it, could, it might not be that one, but our main character tries drugs, tries really wacky combinations to make himself sick because he's a dealer and he deals people these drugs that make them feel pain. Oh, that I don't know. I will have to look it up so that we can um, include it. Any final thoughts about Logan's Run? We've kind of talked about it a little before about the children of the city, rather the people of the city acting like children, is that they did treat everything like games. And uh the idea of games came up many times. There was toying with the runner. There was the idea of carousel itself. They even say, take a chance, carousel. And it looks like a roulette wheel. That's, that's true. When Logan gets to the cathedral and talks to the cubs, he says, all right, children, playtime's over. When he himself is also a child and had been playing bigger childish games, the, the they stop playing games after Box. I think even Box was playing a game. He was toying with them. But after they get out into the open, after they've had that loss of innocence, they don't play games anymore. So there's quite a bit of similarity between this movie and the themes of Lord of the Flies. The Cubs themselves feel very much like the, the kids on that island yes. in that story. It's my final thought. My final thought, I'm kind of reassured in the future, the fat cats of Washington will be literal fat cats. I think that's a, definitely an improvement. Oh, but I'm bumping. <laughs> I loved that he talked to his cats and that the, the idea that if man was alone by himself he'd still have his cats <laughs> well there is one other thing I want to talk about and that's the big climactic fight scene between Logan and Francis I... you mean anticlimactic fight scene <laughs> <laughs> well so I actually like that scene I think it's it's kind of the at least for me the emotional climax to it because Francis is such an interesting character the fact that it's such an incredibly clumsy fight that yeah. it's not despite these guys being sort of policemen in a sense and we can see that they get some kind of physical training that it's two guys just kind of throwing things randomly at each other grabbing whatever they can handy to beat each other with it was a much more realistic looking fight than we see these days and um i i agree that there was it was the emotional highlight of the movie because one basically brother was fighting another over a deep betrayal and those were things you didn't really see we didn't see anything of that deep emotion even we've talked about this a few times even the love story with jessica fell flat but the relationship the brotherly relationship and the betrayal were very very real in that film 
there's something else too I noticed. There's the moment where he gets a hold of I think it's a flagpole and kind of smacks Francis yes, down. Yes, it's an American flagpole. But he keeps hitting him again and again. It almost seems like he hits him one too many times, and that's what gives Francis the head wounds that kills him. It makes you wonder: Did he really have to? Couldn't he have? Yeah. Held off and maybe not have killed him. He probably could have held off, but if you think about it, Francis took the same journey that Logan did. He went through the physical journey of being in the interior to being in the outside world. And he went through the emotional journey of being a Sandman, finding out the truth, and then having a reaction. His reaction being denial to the point of religiously hunting them down. Logan's, when he finally gets there, is acceptance of this new reality. I just wish they had dealt with that to some degree. It's yeah, it's a pretty stark moment where he basically beats his best friend to death and later can say it was the system that killed him, not me. <laughs> no. Alright, uh, that ends our conversation, but not the discussion. If you'd like to have your say about Logan's run or feel that we missed something, check out the comments section for this episode on cinemaspection.blogspot.com and start talking. Email your comments, complaints, questions, and suggestions to cinemaspection at gmail.com you can also like our Facebook page, and if you're on iTunes and like what you hear, please subscribe to us, and if you have a moment to spare, please leave us a review. We appreciate any feedback you can offer. We'll be back to discuss another movie next time. Until then, remember to keep watching closely. There's more to a movie than just what's on the screen. Bye-bye.